Right. Can everyone hear me? Oh, great. Uh, thanks. Thanks for being here. Um, we are gathered here this evening because in uh, September of 1993, uh, Michael published a book, um, Come As You Are, a story of Nirvana. And he decided, uh, which we'll get into, to reread it, reinterrogate it, and basically look back at the decisions he made and, and revisit um, the era of Nirvana. And um, what he produces is a really, really extraordinary and amazing because it gives this sort of, um, you know, really complete picture of the Seattle scene that uh, Nirvana emerged out of, and also, um, you know, the decisions one makes as a, as a journalist, um, getting very close to you know, people that you admire and um, people that are, are making history and, and changing the culture. So um, that's what we're here to talk about tonight. And uh, Michael's going to start with a with a brief reading yeah. annotation. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm not aware of um, an annotated rock book before, except for a book called Ain't It Time We Said Goodbye by a really great uh, early Rolling, Rolling Stone um, journalist named Robert Greenfield. And he did um, kind of a, a lighter version of what I did. And that book was uh, a bit of an inspiration for me. So I want to acknowledge that, but this book is pretty unusual. So I figured I'd set up what I've done with the Amplified Comes You Are by reading just um, one little bit from it. So um, the format is a selection from the original book and then I interject an annotation, uh, a commentary. So it's sort of like a dialogue between uh, the person I was when I wrote that book originally and, uh, and the person I am now. So this is the very beginning of chapter one. Then, so the original book starts, Aberdeen, Washington, population 16,660, is 108 long miles southwest of Seattle way out on the remote Washington coast. Seattle has a lot of rain, but Aberdeen has more, up to seven feet a year, casting a constant dreary pall all over, over the town. Far from the nearest freeway, nothing comes in, and rarely does anything come out. Art and culture are best left to the snooty types over in Seattle. Among the fascinating activities listed in the brochure from the Grace Harbor County Chamber of Commerce are bowling, chainsaw competitions, and video arcades. And I went back and uh, I read the book again and I realized like, ah, you know, there's something to say about that right there. Um, maybe uh, to amplify and, and perhaps uh, correct myself. And so here's the annotation for what I just read. While Aberdeen definitely had more than its fair share of rednecks, violence, and booze, guns, and drugs, and thanks to the de de decline of its once thriving logging industry, not much did come out of the town anymore. I had fallen under the spell of Kurt's disdain for the place, his need to paint it as worse than it really was. In truth, Aberdeen is near a beautiful stretch of Pacific coastline and many state parks. The scenery is spectacular. The lakes, streams, and air are pristine. And in 1992, there was a center for the performing arts, a community theater company, a county choir, and a symphony orchestra. There was a jazz festival and one of the best library systems in the area. Aberdeen had a nice side, if you want to see it. But to coin a phrase, Kurt Cobain will have his revenge on Aberdeen. Many years later, that condescending remark about Aberdeen not caring about art and culture became kind of interesting. In 2007, I went to a small restaurant in the East Village for a performance by the excellent avant-garde cellist Eric Friedlander on the occasion of the release of his album Block Ice and Propane. Recently, I discovered not only that Friedlander's father is the great photographer Lee Friedlander, but that Lee Friedlander, the celebrated choreographer Trisha Brown, and the 
the truly iconic abstract expressionist painter Robert Motherwell all came from Aberdeen. So counting Kurt, four of the most renowned artists of the 20th century all came from one small, remote, beyond unassuming place. Another notable Aberdonian is Douglas, uh, Dr. Douglas Osheroff, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics. After Eric Friedlander said, I walked up and asked him if he had any idea why four artistic giants all came from this one little rough, roughneck town. Huh, I don't know, Friedlander replied, and then called over to some people at a table in the corner. Hey, Dad, come here. <laughs> And up strides the Lee Friedlander, a certifiable giant of American art photography. And we got to talking. Friedlander reminisced about the town's early days, all logging and brothels, and said that Motherwell was renowned around town as a big jock. In the end, he couldn't answer my question, but the moral of the story is that great artists can come from anywhere, not just New York or Los Angeles but maybe not all of them should stay in places like Aberdeen. The great music journalist Michael Gilmore wrote a masterly Rolling Stone piece about Kurt a week or so after Kurt's death. Gilmore happens to be the brother of Gary Gilmore, the infamous convicted killer who demanded the death penalty for his crimes in 1976. Michael's powerful 1994 memoir about growing up with Gary, Shot in the Heart, shows his all too intimate familiarity with guns, darkness, and death wishes. For the Rolling Stone piece, Gilmore visited the North Aberdeen Bridge where Kurt claimed he had camped out when he was homeless. Under the bridge, Gilmore noticed a graffito that he thought might have been in Kurt's handwriting. It read, well, I must be off. It's time for the fool to get out. To save yourself from a dark fate, Gilmore writes, you have to remove yourself from dark places. Sometimes, though, you might not remove yourself soon enough. And when that happens, the darkness leads with you. It visits you not just in your worst mo moments, but also in your best, dimming the light that those occasions have to offer. It visits you and it tells you that this is where you are from that no matter how far you run or how hard you reach for release, the darkness, sooner or later, will claim you. Kurt tried to leave Aberdeen in many ways, not just physically. It was a macho place, so he embraced feminism. It was homophobic, so he stuck up for gay people. Aberdonians loved heavy metal, so he renounced heavy metal. His mom made him wear nice clothes, bathe and have a nice haircut, so he cultivated the grunge look. Aberdeen, to him, was an uncouth, uneducated place, so he sought out people who were more cultured and intellectual than he was, starting with Buzz Osborne and Chris Novoselic. Motherwell, Brown, and Friedlander all got out of Aberdeen in time, but Kurt didn't. I always wanted to move to the big city, he told Jonathan Poneman in a, in a December 1992 spin interview. I wanted to move to Seattle, find the chicken hawk, sell my ass, and be a punk rocker, but I was too afraid. So I just stayed in Aberdeen for too long, until I was 20 years old. So Aberdeen stayed within him, and it claimed him. Returning to their early work, at least in my experience, um, a little bit like finding an old embarrassing photograph or something. Um, so, what? Uh, tell us the origin story of the Amplified. Come as you are. Like, what? What made you pull it back open? Yeah. It's, uh, it kind of started as one thing and continued as another. Um, I, I think every writer knows that phenomenon of uh, finishing a piece or even a book and um, sending it off, and then something magical happens right after you send it off where you get this uh, blazing 
uh, light of clarity about what you just wrote, and you think, oh, I wish, oh, I should have changed that, or I'd like to change that. And as an editor, I'm sure you have, have had plenty of those emails and phone calls. Um, and sometimes those things you know, haunt you for a long time. Um, and I was uh, often reminded of this kind of apocryphal, uh, apparently, story about uh, Kurt uh, sleeping under a bridge after he got kicked out of his house uh, by his mom. And I wanted to write something about that, about, you know, maybe how, how I was sort of bamboozled by someone who was, um, you know, a, a pretty good myth maker. And so I just uh, just went back to the book finally because um, the, the pandemic had started and <laughs> there was just, uh, that was the time when people just did things they'd always meant to do and I, I had always meant to just write something about that. And then uh, I figured, oh well, I'll just put it up in a, my blog and I'll, I'll tweet out a link to that. You know, if anyone's interested, they can read it. And so I wrote that little bit, and I thought, oh, that was, that was pretty good, that was satisfying. I wonder if there's anything else in the book. <laughs> and I went to page one, and sure enough, oh, there was this thing on page one I got to write about. I had to bang that out and turn to page two, and oh, yeah, got something to write about that there. And then, um, you know, in, in the depths of the pandemic, and you have this, you know, unbelievable focus and quiet to, to pursue such things. And, um, I just went on to page three and page four, and two years later, I'd gone through the entire book. <laughs> and um, I spoke to my agent, and um, you know, they said, uh, you, know, you could probably sell this thing. And uh, to my astonishment, I didn't think, you know, that's what a weird thing, an annotated rock book. Who would want to see that? I, I just really did it as a hobby, maybe to help myself uh, figure out what had happened. Uh, we, we can get into this later, but it was, you know, writing that book and the aftermath of it was a really, you know, heavy experience for me, um, both some really great highs and some terrible lows. So I was, I, ever since, it's been 30 years and I'm still trying to make sense of it. And I figured uh, writing it maybe was helping myself make sense of what had happened and maybe uh, help the reader make sense of what had happened as well. No, I, I, I won't give away too many um, spoilers, mm -hmm. but um, there is a point in the book where you seem like you know there's a lot of like behind the scenes of the, of writing the book and and you seem to pinpoint the moment where um, the book actually came together and came into being uh, or or the idea was hatched so um, maybe you could tell us about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I uh, well I had written a, a Rolling Stone uh, cover story about Nirvana that came out in April 1992. Um, I was um, pretty nervous about that. It was, it was my second Rolling Stone cover story, and that was when Rolling Stone cover stories were a really big deal. And it was a big deal for me personally and professionally, and uh, I was very excited to interview uh, the leader of the, the, the hottest, most fascinating rock band um, you know, in recent memory. But uh, I also knew that this guy, Kurt Cobain, uh, was said to be a heroin addict. Um, he smashed his guitars and uh, you know, screamed in his songs and um, was kind of mysterious. And uh, I was a little intimidated. And when I flew out to, meet, to Los Angeles to meet him, uh, I knocked on uh, this little apartment door in the Fairfax section of Los Angeles. Um, this uh, woman I'd kind of heard about called Courtney Love answered the door and offered me a plate of grapes and said, oh, Kurt's just down the hall. And she walked me uh, through, it was a tiny apartment, uh, walked me down the probably a 15 foot hallway that seemed to extend like uh, into this infinity <laughs> because I was so nervous. Um, and I finally got to the end of the hall and opened up the door and there was Kurt lying in bed uh, with his feet sticking out the bottom of the sheets. And I remember his toes were painted this kind of rosy red and that disarmed me right away. But, <laughs> um, and he was just, I'd never interviewed well if someone was in bed before. <laughs> uh, but, um, and he looked up at me and he said, oh, hi. And in that moment, I just realized I know this guy. Like, uh, I, I just, he was familiar. And he was like a lot of people that I'd known in my life. And I don't, um, I don't pretend to be unique in that regard, I think millions, probably tens of millions of people would have had the same response to him in that moment. Like, oh, I know that guy. 
and all of that nervousness went away. And yeah, and I, I think that was part of his genius was um, you know being able to convert that sense of relatability into something, some magical music. Um, yeah, so and we, we kind of hit it off during that interview. We uh, you know, had a lot in common, even though I was the bespectacled, you know, East Coast college boy. Um, uh, he was his, you know, he was he was a high school dropout from rural Washington State. You know, our parents got divorced around the same time. We, you know, we became like stoners around the same time. We listened to the same music. I don't know, just had a lot of common. But again, like millions of people also had the same story. Um, and then um, we reconnected uh, at the Reading Festival that August. Um, it was funny. I was standing in the lobby of this hotel where all the bands stayed. And I was, I was standing there spacing out. And I felt this feeling, this weird, like, like someone's passing their hand over the top of my head, just not really basically touching my head, but uh, strange. And I thought someone was goofing on me. And I just, I, I ignored it and I wait, waited for them to reveal themselves. And I finally turned around and there was Kurt Cobain, you know, uh, about 20 feet away, just staring right at me. <laughs> uh, and I think there was a, maybe a proof of his uh, charisma. <laughs> but uh, and I walked over and we just hit it off again. We just had that chemistry again. And that was in August. And then in late one night in November 1992, the phone rings. And it's Courtney Love, and she says, basically, how would you like to write a book about Nirvana? And I said, hmm, well, that sounds good. Um, and I'm you know, trying to maintain my cool <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, but I said, can I speak to Kurt about it? And she says, sure. She hands me the phone. There's Kurt again, hi, that same hi. And, um, and I told him, uh, yeah, I mean, that sounds interesting, but I don't, uh, I don't want this to be authorized. And Kurt was very savvy. Uh, he knew what authorized means. A lot of people think authorized means that the subject is cooperating with the book, and that's not uh, technically the case in terms of publishing. It, um, uh, you know, it means that the subject has uh, control over the manuscript. And Kurt grasped it. He knew exactly what I meant. And I said, "This can't be authorized." And he said, and this is a direct quote. He said, "No way." That would be two guns and roses. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, all right, you're on. You know, and after that, it was just a matter of um, uh, getting an agent. I, I, I worked with uh, Sarah Lazen, and she hooked me up with a book deal. And after that, uh, it was about, I think, six months to write the book, because it had to come out around the time that uh, In Utero came out, I think, in August, which meant turning it in in like in April. So that was just pedal to the metal. I wrote you know, that book in six months, and that's just insane. And that's partially why I wanted to come back to it, because there was, I just wrote it so quickly. It was just written in the thick of everything. Um, and, there, there was some, and that's also why there's so much to say about it. It's a document you know, of its time. And it's, a, you know, it's a rich text, I think. Um, there's that great line from Courtney where she tells you that Kurt said, that he thought you and he had a similar kind of melancholy. Yeah, yeah that was good. Um, I told that to my dad, and he was really worried. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Kurt and Courtney also wanted a, a certain story to be told, and, and, and you sense that, right? And you can, um, can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I kind like of sense. The Fair article, and, and yeah. yeah. I, I kind of sensed uh, what they were about, but I, I was kind of like a, I was a pretty naive 30 years old. Um, I, and they uh, had recently had custody of their baby taken away from them for a very brief amount of time. And it was really important to them to project to the world that they were actually loving parents. And I, I really think that was the gist of the book, you know, really to, um, to demonstrate that they love their kid. And, and everything else around it was just, you know, kind of the, the bread, you know, of the sandwich. <laughs> and I was, you know, I, I was way more interested in the bread, you know, than, than what they considered the meat. I, I just, I, I, I love rock bands. I love reading about them. I love writing about them. And I've done so, you know, since I was, I don't know, 10 years old, my uh, grandfather <laughs> gave me a book about Three Dog Night, you know, and I, I read it over and over. 
And I just love stories about rock bands. And that's what I wanted to do with, with Come As You Are. And I did that to the best of my ability. And um, uh, I'm sure I was shielded from a lot of, you know, I know I was shielded from a lot of ugly truths, but you know, the, the book, the subtitle of the book is The Story of Nirvana. And that's what I tried to tell. Hopefully um, that's what came across. Now, now obviously um, when you revisited the manuscript, you know, a lot of things caught your attention and you wrote a lot of amazing annotations. But um, I mean, just, you know, generally sitting here now, like what, what seems most different about that time and you know, what sort of most struck you, um, you know, looking back and, and, and reading it again? I think, I mean, you know, uh, the, the, the most obvious, you know, clear thing is just Gen X and, you know, slackers and the first generation that was, wasn't expected to do as well as, as their parents. I mean, that was just a shocking uh, development in American culture um, and uh, uh, an entire generation that had uh, come of age uh, with things like AIDS and a, and a kind of a a second, uh, you know, Cold War brewing and Reagan and all kinds of, you know, pretty tough things to, to deal with. And um, that was kind of the, the context for Nirvana. That was the kind of the social context that, uh, the kind of thing that I would delve into in the amplified version to provide, to try and make sense again to myself and to the reader uh, uh, about, you know, why uh, this happened. Um, um, yeah, I mean, there are all kinds of things. There's, uh, there are annotations about heroin chic, you know, which I think readers at the time may have taken for granted, but now, oh yeah, heroin chic, that was a thing. Um, the Republican moral panics, uh, is exemplified by, by Pat Buchanan's uh, barn burner speech at the 1992 Republican National Convention, uh, which happened the day before Francis Cobain was born, <laughs> setting this incredible context for, um, um, you know, the uh, railing against, uh, you know, permissive uh, drug uh, abusing parents. <laughs> um, so there was all kinds of, uh, yeah, 90s context that uh, I decided to fill in to help uh, contextualize and make sense of what happened. So um, one thing that particularly struck me as a, as a Nirvana and, um, you know, it's just, just how, how miserable um, rock stardom was for, um, well, certainly for Kurt and, um, and definitely the other members of the band. Uh, and can you, can you speak to that a little bit, um, you know, both at the time and, and then again, sort of retrospectively, yeah? Yeah, well, I mean, Kurt, uh, he was a high school dropout. Um, he came from a very provincial town. He felt, um, you know, I think in one song he calls himself the king of illiterature. <laughs> um, very self-conscious about his lack of culture and, and things. And uh, was not ever told that he would be successful at anything. Then he finds punk rock, which was anti-stardom. It was all about not being, you know, the preening, uh, you know, jet-setting uh, rock star. And that, I think he says, that really suited his poor uh, self-esteem uh, perfectly. Um, so he could do what he did without uh, worrying about trying to be famous or a rock star. And um, so you have a, someone with self-esteem who has pegged his uh, identity on this punk rock ethos of uh, uh, exemplified by, actually there's a, there was a record label uh, started by his friends in Olympia called Kill Rock Stars. So that's the kind of mentality that we're talking about here. And then he becomes a rock star. And I think there was a great deal of, of shame about that. He just didn't know how to handle it. It went against the punk rock ethos and it went against his poor self-esteem. And um, I think there are, you know, there are rock stars now who I think, you know, come from a fair degree of privilege. And I think they're pretty, they're comfortable with success, but not a not a working class, you know, high school dropout to be suddenly really famous and having people thrusting microphones in your face and calling you the spokesman of a generation. I mean, that's a hell of a thing to lay on somebody, especially for someone who feels they're not even educated enough to, to speak to it. And um, and he was also a, a 
after a while, you know, he was a pretty serious drug addict, and um, you know, he had a lot of things to hide, and he just he just wanted to um, he just, he wasn't sure about how to handle it, and it's um, um, you know very unfortunate. <laughs> Um, you were uh, lucky enough to kind of have a you know very front row seat on um, you know Kurt's creative process and then you know how the band um, sort of functioned and you know I'd love for you just to talk about that like how you know I don't know how you saw the dynamic of Nirvana and, you know creating their songs. And, well, uh, I mean, yeah. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it, it was Kurt's band. Um, Kurt. You know, approved T-shirt designs and uh, to help design album covers. Um, early on, he wrote the band's bios, <laughs> and those are uh, some of those are re reprinted in the book, and they're they're pretty funny. Uh, but he was very exacting about every aspect of the band, and as you know, as, as much as he kind of projected this feeling of uh, you know being above it all, he was actually incredibly involved in uh, in every like literally every aspect <laughs> of the band. Um, and uh, I think, you know, maybe a great, uh, you know, example of that, almost like a, a metaphor for that would be when I, I visited them when they uh, uh, were rehearsing for their In Utero tour. So it was uh, at that point, Pat Smear had joined the band on second guitar. And I went to a rehearsal uh, and it was just me and, and the band. And Kurt said, oh, you know, it's going to be really boring, but you can come along if you want. And, and I said, yeah, hell yes, I'll, I'll watch Nirvana play. And um, they had this, you know, a, just a totally normal PA system in this kind of, you know, fair, like a room about maybe half the size of this room, you know, totally modest, there no techs, no, you know, no fancy bar or anything, like there's no fanciness at all. It was like a regular band rehearsal room. And they set up and they start playing. And uh, it sounded great to me. I thought they were rocking. But sometimes Kirk would say, no, wait, wait, stop. And they'd stop and he'd give someone a very subtle direction. Just uh, uh, something that I think most people wouldn't have noticed. But, uh, and then they'd pick it up again. And all of a sudden, something would snap into place. And this, like, this really raging, you know, ramshackle music seemingly ramshackle music was actually very exactingly constructed and it, it had an impact because Kurt was extremely careful about how it was made and played and um, yeah it was, uh, it was really amazing to watch his uh, you know his exactitude with seemingly you know messy you know chaotic anarchic music um, there's this uh, wonderful quote from the book that I wanted to read to you and um, get your take on it. So, um, you know, it's interesting because you're, you're, you're both a journalist and, and a friend to the band, um, and, uh, you know, that's a tension you sort of explore in the book. I, I should point out, though, yeah. um, I, while I was writing the book, it was very much a journalist-subject relationship. It was, it was a little, it was after the book was done when I would start to get, like, phone calls in the middle of the night, <laughs> Kurt, you know, having uh, really acknowledging no time difference <laughs> between New York and Seattle, and the phone would ring, and he would, we would just he would just rap with me, and uh, I'd rap with him, and uh, that's when the friendship started. To oh, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, yeah. This is after the book is published, and and you write um, uh, to a certain extent. I was one of those people for a time. I had Kurt's trust and friendship, and it was easy to be intoxicated by that. Being accepted into, into such an intensely rarefied circle is intoxicating. There's no better word for it, because not only does it make you feel a sort of high, it makes you do things you, may, you might not have done if you were sober. And it's like an addiction to, not just because you'll sacrifice other aspects of your life in order to maintain it, but because of how bad you feel when it's suddenly gone. So, maybe we're jumping ahead a little bit, but, um, you know, can you, can you talk about, you know, after the book is published and, you know, the, and, the, and the, yeah, I guess how your relationship changes and, and what it was like being close to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah after a while, uh, you know, I, um, uh, I, you know, I began to realize exactly, or a little bit more anyway, what was really going on 
uh, with, with Kurt. Um, and that really came, uh, really hit home uh, most, uh, with the most impact. Uh, when um, they were in town to play, I think, uh, the CMJ or New Music Seminar, I can't remember. Um, and Kurt said, um, hey, uh, come to this dinner I'm having with a bunch of uh, business people. And um, I went to this dinner in, uh, somewhere in Midtown on the east side. And we were sitting around this circular table, and music biz honchos and stuff. And everyone's ordering steaks, and, you know, wine, and living it up. And um, the, the waiter finally gets around to Kurt and asked him what he wants. And he says, uh, uh, chocolate cake. <laughs> And everybody, you know, kind of looked at him, like, chocolate cake, all right, huh? Um, and that was kind of strange. And then, then Kurt goes off to the bathroom, and a few minutes go by, and then a few more minutes go by, and then four, a few more minutes go by, and I thought, oh, wow, maybe he's done a runner, because he was so uncomfortable with these people. He just, you know, they'd speak to him, and he just kind of would mumble these monosyllabic things back to them. Them, and he was just clearly uncomfortable and unhappy. And I think he invited me to this dinner to show what he had to deal with and how uncomfortable he was with it. Um, but anyway, so he's gone to the bathroom a really long time. And I, I thought, um, yeah, yeah, maybe he's done a runner. And I thought, how hilarious would that be? Um, but then he came back and he was really, really high. Um, you know, the full on, you know, you know, junkie nod. You know, he was stoned on heroin. There's no question about it. And I'd never seen him high before. He carefully, you know, protected that from me. And and I think that was just a really sad kind of protest against uh, all the people at the table and being having to be do business stuff. And and um, they tried to ask him about some of some business questions, and he was just in no shape to answer them. And um, yeah, after a while, dinner broke up, everyone scattered, and I'm standing there on the sidewalk alone with Kurt, who was very high, and uh, I, um, like, no one took care of him. <laughs> it was just me, and I, I walked him back to his hotel. He was really unsteady. I had to hold him by the arm, and uh, I happened to know where the hotel was. I'm not even sure he, he would have known where to go. Um, and I went back and took him back and walked him into this hotel room and Kurt, uh, Courtney was lying on the bed reading something or other. And she was very disappointed. Uh, it was a really sad moment, you know. I, I think she'd been trying to keep him straight and uh, she was she ticked off and she scolded him and he was just sort of making excuses and trying to fob it off for some reason. And uh, then he kind of flopped down on the bed and, went to sleep or something like that. Courtney put her feet up on him like he was a cushion. <laughs> and, um, and I left. And that was, that was when I really realized, like, wow, things are pretty bad. And uh, yeah, uh, that, that was a, really a, a sea change in my relationship with him because it, it went from you know, being uh, maybe uh, something of a confidant to um, uh, having some sort of insight into things that I had feared, uh, but were um, actually came true. Um, you're very acute in the book about um, uh, Kurt and Courtney's marriage, and um, can you talk a little bit about the kind of the role um, you know, she played in his life? Yeah. Well, I, you know, like I said uh, earlier, um, I, Kurt was very self-conscious about his provincial background, and he was constantly seeking out people who could enlighten him about, uh, you know, culture, uh, books and different kinds of music and magazines and uh, not magazines, uh, movies and you know, uh, art and all kinds of stuff. And Courtney is a really, really cultured, intelligent person, incredibly well-read, can talk to you about you know, perfume or impressionism or antiques and all kinds of stuff. And um, I think that was a really um, important thing for Kurt. Um, she is, uh, you know, she was a fellow artist and she uh, challenged him artistically. That was also, I think, really, really key for him. 
Um, he, um, his first real girlfriend was a, kind of an artist, but I think did uh, Tracy Miranda, but I think uh, did challenge him to the extent that he wanted to be challenged. And then he uh, briefly saw a woman named Toby Vale, who was really part of the key part of the uh, riot drill movement, and that was incredibly influential for him. Uh, and then Courtney came along, and that, that was a really important uh, thing for him. And, but also, I, you know, she was pretty tough on him. Um, there's a, a annotation in the book where uh, Kurt talks about, I was talking about a, a top 50 albums list that Kurt gave me. And uh, I was going to print it in the book. And one day I got this call from uh, Kurt uh, it was actually a phone machine message, which I still have. And he said, whatever you do, do not publish that top 50 list. I can't explain it to you now, but it's re-fucking-diculous. <laughs> and what had happened was he had left out all the uncool bands that really influenced him, uh, a lot of metal bands and hard rock bands. And he only put in the, like, the groovy indie rock groups. And Courtney really called him out on that. <laughs> and uh, so she kind of, you know, uh, she also kept him honest, <laughs> um, you know, perhaps sometimes to a fault. Um, so I, I have to note that um, Francis Bean just married um, <laughs> Riley Hawk, I think I have that right. Mm -hmm. um, Most Gen X thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty cool. Um, but there's a great story in the book about um, uh, when you're in Dallas. Um, can, you, can you tell us that story, Francis and Kurt? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, Courtney thought it would be a good idea for me to join Nirvana on tour. And so I did two uh, stretches with them. And uh, that was mostly incredibly fun. And at some point we wound up uh, in Dallas and I got a call uh, to my hotel room uh, from Kurt saying, hey, you know, we're gonna, walk around uh, Dallas, just check it out. You want to come along? And I said, yeah, great. So we went out and we were kind of, it was uh, Pat Smear and uh, Kurt pushing uh, Francis around in a stroller. And it was the strangest thing. I, you know, I, I uh, it was, you know, lunchtime, weekday in Dallas, no one on the streets. It was the craziest thing. No one around, where is everybody? I don't know, you know. Um, but, you know, that's, that's showing what a New Yorker I am, I guess. But I, I gather that's how it is in Dallas or probably Houston and other big Texas cities, I don't know. Um, but it was, it was weird. And so we were just walking around Dallas and kind of took a right turn down off this boulevard and came upon this big empty space. And all of a sudden, we all realized that simultaneously, oh my God, this is Dealey Plaza where JFK was assassinated. And we all stood there, we were like pointing, oh look, there's the School of Depository, and there's the grassy knoll, and like figuring angles, and you know, running through all the, you know, the usual JFK, you know, conspiracy stuff that everybody does. Um, and it was just eerie to come across that um, place. But the, the eeriest thing actually was that there was a, this gigantic flock of grackles circling over to Dealey Plaza, thousands and thousands of birds, and there were so many of them and so dense that it, it made this kind of odd, eerie gray light filter down onto Dealey Plaza. It was uh, just a really strange moment. Um, and then um, uh, Francis started fussing about something, and Kurt said, oh, well, we have to go to the drugstore, and they split off, but, and that was the last time I saw Kurt. Um, so, question maybe, but um, so, you know, what are your, you, you talk a lot in the book about the kind of blind spots and, you know, so what are your regrets or, you know, looking back things, you know, moments or things that could have been said differently or, or maybe you don't have them. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, I felt, you know, reading back through the book, I, I try to catch myself where I was being naive. Um, I was fairly new to the journalism game. I was, uh, I was a fairly immature 30, 31. I'm a kind of fairly immature 
62, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but I'm, I'm more mature now, a little wiser, older and wiser. And uh, yeah, looking back, um, uh, there are things I got wrong or, or things I wish uh, I had researched more, but I just couldn't, I just didn't have the bandwidth. Like I had to write this book in six months. And, and also, uh, while yes, Nirvana was you know, the, most, the biggest, most exciting rock band on the planet at the time, um, I think in, uh, it's just in retrospect that their, you know, their, their legend has grown you know, immeasurably. And so I, 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 was, I was writing in the thick of the moment. I wasn't writing with the benefit of the, you know, the hindsight of history and, and everything that's been discovered and built up about Nirvana ever since. So I, I wasn't writing it with, um, you know, with that uh, with sense of this kind of mythological legendary band. It was a band that was big, and they were happening at the time. I, I wrote the book when while Nirvana still existed, before the myth had really blown up. And and um, so I came back uh, to the book and wrote the Amplified Come As You Are with uh, with the benefit of all that hindsight and the benefit of 30 years of um, wisdom and uh, the benefit of the internet. <laughs> uh, I could go back and, and look at uh, YouTube clips and things and verify or expand on uh, uh, things that I just glanced over um, in, uh, in the original book. Um, I think we're getting the, uh, the time call. Um, well, thanks for answering all my questions. And thanks for asking them. And now I believe uh, if anyone in the audience would like to ask questions. During the pandemic, I moved to Olympia and I decided to make a documentary on Aberdeen. And from all the locals, including family members of Kurt, it was a spotted owl that killed the industry, which brought Kurt to going to, from house to house to house whenever he was younger. And it wasn't special, it wasn't Kurt. It was just, that was just the daily life for a kid, for an adolescent to live in uh, Aberdeen. So um, I never could find anything other than that with the, uh, the Spotted Owl. What's your take? Um, well, I, I, I actually have an annotation about the Spotted Owl. <laughs> uh, funny you should mention that. Um, I don't know if you've read the book. Uh, yeah, there's a whole, yeah. You know, that's one of the, that's a kind of a typical thing that I would, would expand on in the Amplified Come As You Are because the, you know, the Spotted Owl, I don't know, if, Thing. That was a big thing back in 1991, 1992. In fact, I think the Spotted Owl was on the cover of Time magazine. It was a whole big thing. And it had, um, uh, environmentalists were trying to protect this, uh, I forget the exact term, it's not an endangered species, it's, it's a little, uh, little better than that. Um, but, um, and so the, the protecting the Spotted Owl really uh, put a huge dent in uh, Aberdeen's um, business model, and a lot of people were, were unemployed, and consequently, you know, a lot of uh, the, the usual fallout from uh, unemployment, like violence and alcoholism and drugs and divorce and things like that. So, um, that the spot of that was, was a really big deal. When I visited Aberdeen um, for the Rolling Stone cover story, they were, um, we pasted on uh, light bowls and things around the city, uh, around Aberdeen, were um, uh, recipes for spotted owl stew. <laughs> that, you know, people were really, really angry about that. And um, uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, George H.W. Um, Bush um, actually had a speech about, uh, mentioned the spotted owl in a speech, and he, he didn't understand why uh, they were prioritizing a, a, a bird over people's jobs. And there was a lot of resentment in Aberdeen about that. So yeah, spotted owl is a really big deal, yeah. Is, I got an annotation for you, pal. Thanks. Um, Wes, were you aware of um, Kurt's um, like, um, eating issues? I don't know if he even had like, like, some kind of eating disorder at some point, and, and if people didn't talk about that, there's even an article now in other kinds of eating disorders that 
he may have had, you know, or maybe it was a consequence from, you know, the way he was bleeding too, and, uh, and then also about ADHD. Um, I, you know, I, frankly, I wasn't aware of uh, any, any eating disorder um, on Kurt's part. I know there's people theorize about that. Um, I, I, like, I, I think he did, uh, he was kind of painfully aware of how uh, thin he was. You know, he's, he's, he was what uh, we used to call in my high school a pinner dude. <laughs> um, he was, you know, pretty slight guy. And he would wear like several layers of clothes to make himself look bulkier. Um, if maybe only to seem more intimidating in a kind of a roughneck town, maybe. Um, but, you know, it's funny about the eating because uh, on the, a lot of the interview tapes, uh, uh, which were done uh, for, the, uh, for the book, uh, in Kurt's uh, kitchen in the wee hours of the morning, and uh, you can often hear Kurt um, chewing food <laughs> on the tape. Um, so, you know, if, uh, you know, I'm glad I didn't have misophonia uh, otherwise, I would have had terrible trouble uh, transcribing those tapes because he's always you know, chewing on Cheerios or something like that. And they, they had, they didn't. Kurt and Courtney didn't want to go out to dinner very often because they would just get hassled. So they had someone um, pre-cook meals and put them in plastic tubs, <coughs> and they just the refrigerator was full of like Tupperware tubs of individual meals. And Kurt would often nip into those while he was doing the interviews. And, um, so yeah, I'm not, not aware of an eating disorder. Um, his his he had a second cousin or something like that named Bev Cobain who has a, an accreditation as a nurse and um, some sort of um, mental health uh, uh, field, and she she's quoted as saying that um, Kurt had, and I'm so unclear on the distinction. Maybe someone could fill me in. On um, she said he had ADD or ADHD. I'm not sure. Um, it's, it's in the book correctly. Um, and so there was that. Um, other people have said he was bipolar. He certainly um, uh, talked about manic depression a lot. He, you know, it just came up in conversation. He, but he, he sometimes claimed he was narcoleptic. Um, he uh, thought he was maybe paranoid. He, he just came up with all kinds of maladies. Um, he did have scoliosis. Um, um, uh, some people still don't believe that he had a terrible stomach pain. Um, I, I'm absolutely convinced that was real. His, his mom had it too. Um, Chris Novoselic, his, you know, his close friend, verified that he had it. Um, and, um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a, a psychiatrist, so I can't diagnose ADHD, uh, but I never saw any sign of that or uh, certainly never, I, I never saw really any manic phase or any depressive phase, it was just kind of Kurt. Um, never detected any narcolepsy either. <laughs> Hi, I'm curious, um, obviously you did uh, interviews and were on the ground when the original uh, book was published and you've spoken about how you did a lot of this during the pandemic, but did you go back um, and re-interview people or interview new people, or were you going off of your memories and Google searches and whatever during the pandemic? Because I, I didn't want this book to be, to, to sprawl too much, I, uh, I only, I, I can find any, uh, the, uh, the annotations anyway, to what was in the book. Because uh, as I said, like, the book was written while the band existed in that time uh, without any the benefit of retrospect. So it's, the book itself is a product of its time. And there was a lot to say about it without uh, needing to uh, add to it. So there's, um, uh, you know, I don't know, just, this just brings to mind, like uh, in the book, I, um, I, I know, uh, I walk into, uh, Kurt and Courtney uh, lying in bed in their hotel room, and they're watching a Leif Garrett movie, or a Leif Garrett movie. And I didn't say anything, note anything about it in the book, but in retrospect, I thought, wow, how interesting that they're, they were obsessed with Leif Garrett. Why? <laughs> Leif Garrett, for, you know, I, I actually have to explain in the book, he was this kind of teen, pop, you know, hit up pop star. And, 
and they were obsessed with it. Why? And it took me 30 years to realize, oh, Leif Garrett was someone who was confronted with sudden fame and money and uh, fell into drugs and, and had tragedy uh, visit him very brutally. And so they were studying him. And that's the kind of thing that you could kind of pick out of the book um, and, and elaborate on and, and amplify. And so that was the approach I took. I wasn't trying to rewrite the book or, or expand it. Uh, I was just trying to find things within it that were interesting and telling. Just, if only just to keep it from uh, sprawling into something completely uh, formless and you know, uh, untamable. <laughs> Um, so that, that was the strategy. I tried to be really strict about that. And then there is a last chapter that's all about um, um, what happened after the book. And again, I'm not trying to do any detective work or history uh, writing about, about Kurt. I'm just writing about my experience. And I, I think that uh, I had enough experience with him uh, personally without delving into you know, researching stuff that I wasn't present for to uh, add something to the story. You know, um, uh, Danny Goldberg, um, who owned uh, Gold Mountain, which was Nirvana's management company, wrote a, a really good book uh, himself. And um, Sarah, what was the title? Well, yeah, Danny left. Um, but anyway, Danny wrote a really great book, and that's his point of view, and that's priceless. Uh, and I thought, well, I have a point of view too, and I have a set of experiences that I can contribute to help also shed light. And uh, if, if enough different people uh, contribute their points of view and shed enough light, you know, maybe uh, the picture will become clearer. So I've got someone right over here, but I know there are people in the middle too, so. Um, you mentioned earlier that after you published the original version that um, uh, Kurt would call you and y'all would talk <laughs> for hours on the phone. Um, I'm curious if you have a moment that stands out to you now, like when, as you got closer after the book was published, yeah, if you have like a, a moment where you guys connected in a way that you reflect back on often. Um. That's a, uh, I have to think about that. Um, I, I don't know if it was a, I, I guess he, he would call, you know, late at night. The phone would ring, you know, like 3 a.m. <laughs> and I, I knew who it was, obviously. Um, and I never wanted to just let it ring because I thought, well, maybe something really horrible is happening. And, um, and some, you know, at least once something horrible was happening. And so I made sure to pick up the phone, and he, you know, I, he would just start talking, and I would be just, you know, semi-conscious at first, anyway, and and he would just unload about just stuff. Um, he was really uh, obsessed with um, net versus gross <laughs> with his management company. It's, you know, why are they taking out these expenses? Oh, so, you know, blah blah blah, and he would just kind of go off. And he would go on for quite a while. And then he just, you know, I remember one time specifically, he just suddenly stopped and he said, what, but how are you? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I just, I just thought, well, that's, that was really thoughtful. Like a lot of people are so self-obsessed that they didn't, wouldn't even think about the other person's state of mind. And, um, and I told him, and he was a really great listener. And, you know, despite, you know, his, uh, his, you know, his eventual fate, um, you know, funnily enough, he actually gave really nice life advice. <laughs> uh, so, I, I, you know, I think it was those late night phone calls, frankly, uh, and especially, you know, when he stopped and asked me uh, enough about me, like, how are you doing? Uh, he, was, he was really uh, valued the, the quality of empathy, and uh, that's something I come back to a lot in the annotations. And uh, he tried to practice it as, as much as possible, and I, I thought that was just really sweet. There's the one here. Um, I think it was on Twitter, if I'm not mistaken, that you said you finally figured out like a hidden meaning in, in utero, 
and like I guess without giving away the meaning, how did you come upon that like years later? Um, yeah, yeah. There's a. Yeah, I mentioned you know Kurt had uh, exerted you know great control over um, you know the artwork uh, for every Nirvana album. And on the back of In Utero, there are these little, I don't know, maybe 20 tiny little symbols. And they look maybe like almost decoration to some people. But um, Kurt and Courtney were really obsessed with this book. Um, uh, it's like the, the Woman's Dictionary of uh, uh, Symbols from Classic um, you know, Myths or something like that. I can't remember the exact title, but I, you know, I just said, oh, that's interesting. Um, and I didn't think twice about it. Again, I was in a real rush. I was like pedal to the metal for six months writing this damn book. And so they mentioned this you know, mythological symbol encyclopedia, and I just, oh, okay, great. And um, I, uh, I remember the title of that book while I was writing the, the amplifications. And I, I, I hold it out and I started matching the uh, symbols with, the, with what was in the book. And um, a secret message emerged. It was pretty damn fascinating. <laughs> uh, 